beauty. I can't take it. <laughs> <laughs> so welcome, everyone. So all of you were tasked with playing the same character over multiple decades, which I imagine is quite a challenge. As performers, what would you say was the biggest challenge of keeping focused on a time-hopping narrative like this? Matt, we'll start with you. Uh, well, first of all, thank you so much, everyone, for being here tonight and supporting the show. It means a lot to all of us. I think, honestly, we were so blessed to have really seven eight episodes before we started with an outline of the eighth. So we had a good sense of the trajectory of the characters, but it was really on those days when you were jumping, you know, 20, 30 years in a, in a day, in the same day. We had to, <laughs> I had like a whole, whole physical routine and, and kind of ritual that I did with myself and a mantra for each age just so I could try to, you know, put myself in the mindset that, that Hawk was in at a different time period. So, um, but we were very fortunate. Ron was so, such an incredible leader all the way through this. And, and uh, the fact that we had such a, a sense of the story from A to Z from the get-go was really helpful. Would anyone else like to speak to that? Yeah, I mean, uh, um, for Tim, I, I mean, I was like Mr. Potato Head. Because there was so many different glasses and mustaches. And just, <laughs> <laughs> I was like, how? <laughs> <laughs> but, but yeah, the I think it's testament to the design team as well. Yeah. And um, yeah, it is. Joseph, who was the costume designer, and Michelle, who did the the wigs, and Jordan did makeup. Like I've never before had the opportunity to sort of work not along just alongside incredible sort of acting squad, um, but also with the creatives. You know, every morning with Ori would just be like you know an amazing masterclass, but also the opportunity to tell the story in so many different ways whether it's the, phys you know, the physicality of the characters um, or the aesthetic. I think it was um, so well realized. It was pretty special, I think. I think a lot of the history um, also helped. A lot of research and learning about the history of the different times allowed us to understand what the circumstances of the world were in order to step in and say, oh, well, at this point in life, I actually can't have as much joy or experience <laughs> as I did before. And or, uh, you know, uh, the tumultuous things that have happened in, in uh, American history influence how you interact with other people. And uh, I think that was really, really big in this show. I was going to ask about research because I know all of you did a lot and uh, especially learning about the lavender scare, which, you know, maybe you had heard about, maybe not. Uh, what kind of research did you do and, you know, what, how did that help you? <laughs> you know, I think like as gay people, you think that uh, gay history starts at Stonewall and then goes forward, but, you know, it, it really doesn't. And and so it, going to the show and like going to the history of it, Google was my best friend. <laughs> I'm just going to be honest here. And I came along like a bunch of amazing documentaries and books and things like that to really dive deep into it. It was, it was a wonderful process. I spent a lot of time talking to my grandmother, um, who has since passed but was alive while we were preparing the show and working on it. And she would have been a contemporary of Lucy's. And her best friend, Annie, I recorded her voice, and she basically informed the way Lucy spoke. And her sister was a Lucy. And so she was able to tell me firsthand what that experience had been like. And it was just, there's no substitute, of course, reading the history and everything, but there's no substitute for firsthand experience trying to understand the emotional experience of it and all of that. And also like putting mm -hmm. myself back in that time in a room of men where speaking up at all is is a big deal for Lucy, you know, even if it's her dad and her soon to be husband, trying to remind myself like, oh yeah, I would just be silent in this whole scene normally. And if I have a line, it's a big moment of being plucky and having long <laughs> um, So just trying to remember like, okay, yeah. Whereas in real life I'd be like, well, can I just open the floor? Um, so th that, that part is also important, putting yourself back in your place in history. Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, Jonathan, I read that you and Matt did your first chemistry read on Zoom. How does that even work? <laughs> you can tell. <laughs> um, yeah, I think we were, I think there was about 10 people, and then Bronx here. He's off right there, room. I already spotted him. And you're very wizard. Um, yeah, and I had a conversation before with Dan and Han, who directed the first two episodes, and then and then I was introduced to to Matt, uh, and you just this the way you know when you you know zooms are terrible anyway, but when you're diving in and knowing that on the other side of it is half of Showtime, Fremantle, and Matt Bone, um, <laughs> this guy's kind of terrible. But um, but yeah, I think they just pin they pin you so that you there's just you and well me and Matt. 
and then they all just sign off. And at that moment, it goes deathly quiet. <laughs> and um, and we did the bench scene a, a few times, a few times in a few different counties in the eighties. Yeah, we did. We did the scene. Yeah, when they talk the first time in the eighties, actually about you know him moving to to Italy. Anyway, yeah. So it was um, yeah, it's funny. Because the worst thing, you know, you sign off at the end of it and then you go about your day. <laughs> <laughs> and everyone else was sort of, you know, united in. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But, you, I mean, it was such a family. I mean, there's so many years Ron's been working on this. And I know Matt had already been a part of it for two years. So it was like stepping in. It was sort of, it, it felt like a click, but. It was um, like, for sure. I mean, we were, I, I was a massive fan of Johnny. Well, long before this show came into being for me so we, we were just so lucky to have him on board and it was so clear from the first time we read together that he was going to bring such a nuanced layered interpretation of the character to the table on the and so it was, it was pretty easy. It was as easy as a Zoom chemistry read. Oh. <laughs> That's why it's sometimes we're glad the bandwidth goes. You're in three pixels. <laughs> Make him fill in the gaps. Nobody accidentally muted, nothing like that. It's good. So, no, uh, Frankie has a lot of great looks in oh, the yeah. cozy corner. But we, <laughs> we must talk about his incredible drag moment with, uh, as Mrs. Claus. Um, oh, yeah. As an actor, how does it feel? It's the season. How does it feel to embody Frankie's power as a drag performer? I mean, it feels great. Like, I, I will never forget putting on my first dress, which is that big black, you know, uh-huh. bell. And I start, I got, dre- I got dressed and it took so long, got my makeup done and everything. And I'm walking down the hall, like, just as Noah, and the sea is just parked. <laughs> I was like, I was like well, yeah. and then I, I realized it was me. And so, like, that day I was like, oh my God, there's so much power in being a drag queen. Like, there's so much power that comes with that, with the dress, with the heels, with the whole thing. And so as we went on, I really enjoyed every moment of that, embracing it. You know, I, I learned how to shave my legs. <laughs> Not well. But I, I, I learned, got a couple of battle scars along the way. Yeah, I still get some corns on your, on your toes. Or anything. I still got those corns, huh? <laughs> but I, but, yeah. Good thing we didn't have any fake scenes. Uh, no foot no in the mouth for me, sorry. There's so much power in drag, and it's such an incredible art form, and I'm so happy it's depicted on screen. I, th- I think it's quite special. <laughs> Absolutely. Allison, I want to talk about a scene in episode six, uh, which recently aired. We learned that Lucy had intercepted Tim's letter, and so she's known. And uh, she's so composed when she reveals this to Tim, but it's, like, devastating how composed she is. What was... How did you... F- find the right tone for that scene. We did it a few different ways. Temperatures, I would say, like from lukewarm to freezing. We were never in the warm area. In my mind, for Lucy, this is a moment she didn't know would ever come. And she had probably contemplated taking this to her grave and never revealing this. And in that moment, it felt like the only way to get power, the only way to regain the floor in her own home with her own family, the only way to feel like she was grounded again and had the upper hand, and this is her life that you are intruding in, was to say, you know, I fucked you over a long time ago, and I'm gonna reveal that information now as you're on the way out and don't let the door hit you. (laughs) And in her mind, keeping it totally neutral and composed would have been the most um, searing way to deliver that information and the only way to get through it. I mean, if she had allowed the emotion of it to come through, there's no way she would have been able to maintain that core that she had spent so long working on. And Jonathan, it's such a huge scene moment for Tim as well. How did you approach it? Um, Yeah, I think there's something, one of the things that I think is really fascinating is about the moment, what what truth means in the world of Sunday Champlets and to all the characters. And and the simpler the delivery of truth in this, the more impactful it is, and you tell it that way. And... Yeah, it's a really harrowing moment, I think, for Tim, but it's sort of probably making sense in quite a few things. The, it, going back to Ron. Let's <laughs> <laughs> um, also talking about the, the temperature, and, and we have four incredible directors. And I do think that some, some of Ron's mastery in this is also working out exactly what the temperatures are between Frankie yeah. and Marcus and Tim and, yeah. and also Lucy. And it's, there's a sense of sort of orchestration in that. And so it was really great with these directors to be able to explore those scenes, and, and especially when these two characters meet, and we're all in 
um, orbit of Hawk, the character, yes. and to, for Tim and, and Lucy to have that moment, you know, it would it would have been unfair or uh, upsetting not to be able to try and be enjoying. Yeah. Um, so yeah, you know, it's, it's testament to the end. So it's on. Thank you, Jelani. You kept journals in Marcus's voice, and I understand some of those uh, sentiments ended up in the show. Can you tell us a little about that? Yeah. So when I um, began to understand and unpack Marcus, I realized that he was in love, or he became in love with Langston Hughes, and so I read a lot of Langston Hughes poems, and you know, I then began to be like, well. But if Marcus started to write poems as like a result of learning from Lexi Hughes, so I get to do that in his voice. Um, and I would always joke with Ron, I said, Ron, are you going to pay for my therapy bills after this story? <laughs> because I'm, you're putting me through trauma after trauma, and I, d I don't know a way to kind of um, heal myself from this. And so writing in the voice of Marcus was actually healing for me. Um, and we would have discussions about scenes together, and I would bring the writing to the discussions, and I'd say, hey, I think, I think this is what the internal monologue of this thing kind of is. And he's like, well, why don't we just use those words? Um, and it was really powerful, and it was a really um, beautiful collaboration that I am so grateful for. Thanks, Ron. Oh, it's amazing. Uh, so, Matt, in one interview, you referred to Hawk as a kind of, quote, queer anti-hero. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about what you mean by that? Mm. I, I just found it so liberating to play a character who was very proudly a dissident, <laughs> even if he did that by playing the game. There was sort of a, a fuck you underneath it all which was really liberating because that's not how I chose to survive. <laughs> I was just like, just get out of here. But uh, the fact that he, so much of, you know, typically with a character, you, you're always looking for the shadow, the shadow aspects of the character. And typically they're the, the, the aspects of ourselves that we like to hide. And, and Hawk was the inverse of that in a lot of ways. He often led with the characteristics that we typically think of as shadowy and what he hid were his love, were his affections. And he is somebody who has his allegiances and his, his own moral code um, and certainly has a sense of compassion. But if anything threatens his survival, he knows exactly how to compartmentalize it and cut it off. And I think he's been given a lot of perspective, um, both from his history with Kenny and then also serving in the military. He has a whole worldwide perspective and he thinks, you know, I, I did all this for our country and I come back and, and you're going to treat me like a dissident. Like he, he has a fuck you about it all. It was just really... Um, unique for a queer character in my experience. I think all the characters kind of have a little fuck you inside of all of them um, to uh, the world and the, and how unfair it's being treated as being queer. Um, I think one of the things that like we all tried to find in our characters was a great strength and that stems actually though it's like the anti-hero is considered someone who could be closer to the villainous side there still is that hero's journey and strength within each of these characters in being like, well, the world says we can't be this thing, but we're going to actually prove it right, prove it wrong, that we can be who we are. Um, and it takes the characters a long time to get there, but they get there eventually. Yeah. And what I loved about, sorry, what I loved about him is he didn't feel like there was anything wrong with him. Mm. <laughs> mm. <laughs> Everything was wrong with him. So it was really a great experience to get to live that. Mm. I think also there's something just listening to you Jelani like there's something quite meta about this isn't there because we've never seen this sort of eight hour elevated tv series predominantly led by a queer creative and and you've got four out gay actors here and so that sort of joy and strength I think mm. just is palpable throughout. No, you said something sort of relating to this in an interview you talked about how being yourself can be its own act of protest and how did you sort of incorporate that idea into your portrayal of Frankie? Yeah, well thank you for asking but you know I I mean I walk around in my life as a black gay man. I mean I I carry that with me every single day and I don't hide it, I celebrate it. And I, I learned like that that in itself just being on this earth and being proud of who you are it, it says so much. And, and it says things to, to the younger generation as well, to, to, to really be themselves and be authentic. And that's one of the greatest things that I took from playing Frankie. You know, every day I try to check in with myself and be like, am I really being me? You know, and so I think it's a beautiful thing. I love this journey of, of putting down the heels and going for the gay liberation movement and fighting the good fight. And I think it's I think it's so important. Jonathan, we have to talk about the accent. You worked with a dialect coach to hone Tim's accent, what was the most, this is a two-part question, what was the most use, useful technique you learned 
And secondly, what was the hardest word to pronounce <laughs> with an American accent? <laughs> <A> talk. <laughs> but then you really just leave with your mouth full anyway. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, yeah. Back to the question. So, work. Uh, some work. Um, I, 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 I started uh, working with someone in London called Carter Bellamy, he was amazing. And uh, that was in person, which was great. And it was, I was doing a play at the time, it, it all sort of happened very quickly. Um, so it was kind of white knuckle. Yeah, there were definitely vowel sounds, and I was saying this earlier, <laughs> depending on the, the hour of the day, because, you know, the North American um, uh, schedules. <laughs> <laughs> I need to really film for 18 hours. And uh, well, on the 17th hour, some of the uh, vowel sounds would, um, would uh, form it. You know, form that was for all mystical <laughs> <words>. <laughs> I don't know what you're saying, like, yeah. Uh, but no, uh, I had an amazing guy called Michael who was on set, and, and it, again, it just, the, the camaraderie and the, and the teamwork between me and him, having someone there, and I learned so much from the freedom that you can get with an accent, also with playing a character over 30 years and how you can use the voice. It's just an amazing opportunity, and I just think if this hadn't been written or if we weren't invited to be a part of it, we might never in our careers have experienced it. Um, but this, and that's just one facet of it. But, um, but Michael just said to me, he said, I am here to, you're gonna outsource your anxiety about this and I'm gonna hold on to it. And I just think that is what so much of Fellow Travelers is about. Yeah. And so that was amazing. And I had an amazing you know, assistant as well, who was just brilliant. But so, <laughs> so I, could, I could pronounce assistant in the right. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. I'm not you did well. Alison, did you work with a dialect coach I did, as well? What yeah. was the what were your uh, what were you working on? I um just trying to I have a very modern everything and so like trying to get rid of all of like the just this is gotta <laughs> just can't do that. <laughs> <laughs> um but also she was a very um, enthusiastic smoker for a very long time that does a lot to your vocal cords also age happens slower them so one of the things that we, as i had a very similar experience one of the things we did is we had a note on a scale for every decade and so in the 50s she was higher voice and then by the by the 80s she was a little bit more down here and in the warm-up she would just kind of listen to it it was the same feeling of being able to outsource this whole the whole creative team on this show is so brilliant that we literally didn't have to worry about anything other than our job mm -hmm. and as we all know in this room that's not always the case you're not always lucky enough to just focus on exactly only what you have to do you don't have to think about your props your costumes your hair your makeup your voice even like those things were all being taken care of by and shepherded by people who were such <laughs> extraordinary experts and so that was just one of the many people i was lucky to work with on this so I've been covering TV long enough to remember a time when networks wouldn't even let two gay characters kiss. Poor Matt on Melrose Place. Um, <laughs> but obviously that's not the case with fellow travelers. <laughs> 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 Why? I get to just sit back during this part. Remember our scene? I could never forget our scene. Our steamy, our, our steamy, full of desire sex. <laughs> 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 it's okay. I've done my fair share. It's not personal. Why do you think it's so important to have this kind of frank and and you know loving and open depiction of queer intimacy on screen? For years. We have been sitting in those seats watching straight people do exactly that, and no one asked a question about it ever. You know, I, no. Uh, for that, you to be a thing that we have to defend or kind of uh, 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 somehow become, say, we're now that fellow traveler shows this much sex is kind of like gross, <laughs> honestly. Um, and I think uh, with the tenderness and care that we all have for each other and each other's bodies and each other's spirits and hearts, I hope that translates into the um, language of the body that you see on the screen. Um, I think that Ron was really, really strict on making sure that every scene, when it involved sex, it was moving the story forward. 
Um, and there's also a contrast between Tim and Hogg <laughs> sex, between Marcus and Frankie sex, and between um, Hogg and Lucy sex. There is, there is a need. That's there, what you mean. There are different, well, there's different <laughs> needs, right? There's different needs. Um, well, and certainly different body parts. Right? So, um, uh, and I think um, when I watch it back, I never ever feel taken out of the story by watching the sex. I'm actually drawn in. I'm like, Oh, what are these characters learning and experiencing in this moment? Um, and, and, and and I think it's unique, as Beyonce today. <laughs> Matter, Jonathan, was thing you wanted to add to that discussion? I think July put it so beautifully. I just uh, for our characters, they were never the same. The relationship was never the same after one of their intimate connections as it was before. And I think that's a huge testament to the writing and and scenes like that serving a real purpose in the story. And there are so many different power dynamic shifts that happen between Tim and Hawk over the course of those four decades. Uh, and they reflected in those scenes. Um, and I, I think just, we were just so lucky, I was so lucky to have Johnny and Allison as my scene partners who just understood their roles so well. And when they called action, were willing to, we had a sense of comfort, I think, with each other and were mm. able to find things in the moment. I, obviously, we're so fortunate now to have intimacy coordinators, and it's such a beautiful thing to have on set, but it's also nice to be able to find things in, in the moment and to trust your scene partner to do so. And so I just, I felt really lucky to have them in those scenes. Yeah, and, and Matt Bober is the best captain you could ask for. Oh, my God, the best. Can we get a round of applause just for Matt Bober? Yeah. Executive producer and star of this, of this television series. Um, someone asked me earlier today in an interview, they were like, so what was it like to sit across and do scenes with Matt Bomer and like look into his eyes every day? And I honestly said, well, now it's hard to go on dates, honestly. <laughs> so you don't have the eyes of Matt Bomer at all. Uh, uh, but also, <laughs> there's not a single person up here that I wouldn't look into their eyes and see love. Um, and I hold that to a high respect because not a lot of projects that you work on where you really mean that and feel that and you feel comfortable um, coming to work and, and sharing love. That's so sweet. Um, I'm wondering what kind of response you've gotten from viewers uh, since the show has been airing. Uh, Jonathan, I read, I believe in one interview, you talked about getting messages from people. It's been amazing. And um, of course, you know, with this specificity of this queer experience and, and everyone's individual experiences or the characters within the orbit of Hall. Um, it's, I realize how universal that is. And you, the, uh, uh, like on Instagram, terrible Instagram, in terms of. <laughs> <laughs> but I, you, but I, the, I've been reading some messages that are extraordinary because, of course, so many people are so surprised by, you know, the 53, how to scare and exactly how brutal that was for so many people. But the truth is, so many people are living like that now in the world. And um, and there are so many people who are Lucy's uh, who have also reached out and the daughters and sons of Hawks and Lucy's and there's so many people who have a Tim and there's a beautiful conclusion to this story um, which broke all of us, I think, and then mended us all together. So I know that you maybe have seen it already or you'll be about to go on that journey, but just, there's just the, the beautiful way that Bron, um concluded it is just that idea that this is just one love story of so many um uh, and in the 80s um so of course it's so moving to be able to do something that is that important and is that pioneering really in terms of and yeah it's extraordinary nature uh, to, to receive those messages is incredible there are so many black men that come up to me and say i have never seen myself in something until i've watched marcus and that's how I felt when I read it. Um, and so to have that like kind of like uh, mirrored back to me is the most gratifying feeling as an actor on earth. No, how about you? Yeah, I was actually at Thanksgiving. Um, Thanksgiving. <laughs> <laughs> do you have, it, do you have it other days? <laughs> no, 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 I, you know, Monday, Tuesday, whatever. <laughs> And I was eating, and <laughs> yes, I was gonna, it was like a Friendsgiving, and, and there was some older gays there, and they found out I was in the show, and I'm, I'm eating my, you know, stuffing, and I hear this man, like, sniffling next to me, and he just, all he looks at me and says is, I feel like I'm watching my life. 
And that, like, my heart, like, just, like, you know, fell my butt. And I, I realized in that moment, I was like, thank, we got it right. Like, we, we set out to, like, honor this amazing experience and give back to this community and do something bigger than ourselves. And just seeing that man say that to me, it, it, it gives me chills right now in this moment. And so that, I've gotten a lot of messages, but that's the one I heard loud and clear on Thanksgiving. I, I did also, my 93-year-old grandpa watched it. And I, she watched the first episodes on her own, obviously, as in she lives on her own. <laughs> but I didn't watch it with her. And my, I had a family party, and my sister came in from Australia, and she was like, I'm going to go over in Chelsea, and is there anything we want to ask? I was like, just ask how she finds flesh out <laughs> No subject area in general. <laughs> Broadly curious for her review. And Hilaire, Hilaire, she loves it. She's, she was born the same year as Tim. She's lived through all of it. Brought so many interesting conversations to me and her. But there is one thing that she said to my sister, um, having watched from the first episode, she said, I didn't know he had it in him. <laughs> I, I think I will, I will say that uh, there's a mark. Yes, I should just stop answering that question now. <laughs> I think people from all walks of life seem to feel seen, and, and queer people of all ages um, have approached me, and, and it does, it, they feel seen, and I think as an artist, that's what you're always hoping for, is that you're doing work, and, and it's such a testament to Ron and, and these actors that you're, you're, you're doing work in these scenes that hopefully resonate to somebody, and, and that they can see themselves in it in some way, and, and that it, it causes some reflection or discovery in their own life, and so... Uh, the fact that folks have had that response has, has just been really um, all we could hope for. I think. Yeah. Matt, I just wanted to ask you about something you alluded to earlier about growing up in Texas. And you've said before uh, that that experience did help you a little bit relate to Hawk. Can you tell us a little bit more about how that helped? <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, I grew up in a, kind of a Friday Night Lights type of town. Um, where you know the football game was the social option on a Friday night. I was in a family that went to church three times a week. So, um, and I just got, I knew one queer guy, and he was so cool. And his name was Jim, and he came with us on the church like youth group retreat one time, and he did this. He performed the song Seven by Prince, and he was like grinding in the minister's face. I was like, you're a badass. But he was the only one, and it was. I, I felt like, particularly in my own family, I had to find my own way to survive. And so there, there was an aspect uh, of, of code switching that I had to do in order to just be able to get out of Texas and find my tribe somewhere and, and so I could get in touch with my own authenticity. And I think um, Hawk relates to the world in much the same way. For me in high school, the stakes were life and death, whether that was social death, familial death, whatever it was, it felt like that to me. And I think those are the same mistakes that Hawk is operating under on a daily basis, particularly in the 50s. Ooh. So finally, uh, I want to talk about the show looks so beautiful. Uh, the costumes, the production design, all of it. So I'm going to ask each one of you, what did you steal from the set? Ah. <laughs> because we know you did. No, uh, you go first. OK. Well, if I could, I would <laughs> I would steal the entire cozy corner because I think it's so cool. I'm like, where is that bar in New York? I want to go there. But I, I I might have a couple of heels. I might have some lace shirts, <laughs> and I I might have some fishnets. So anyways, but those things are made into the picture, or or like just things you just try to. Those are things just have in the house. Those are just yeah. You're sitting in my closet. Um, I actually took um. A plaque from the set. Um, one of the, my favorite sets in the whole uh, TV show is Marcus and Frankie's apartment um, in the 70s and 80s. Oh, yeah. um, and there's a plaque um, uh, from, uh, that Ron and I kind of like made up this idea that Marcus won this award um, for his book called, um, um, uh, oh my God, I'm going to play. What was it called? Divided Capital, but the second one was, uh, <laughs> I think it was like the white world and one and one man, or one black man or something. It was, I'm, I'm gonna paraphrase it, but but it was really powerful and moving to me and I said, I'm taking this off the wall and I'm putting that right up to my apartment. And it's right next to our little fellow travelers uh, lavender poster. I have, a, I have a lot of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I have a lot. I, no, I have, I have, I have 
please use the lighter. It's all important. I have her lighter. Um, and I also have a lot of her costumes, and they are totally preserved in their plastic thing. Joseph packed them up perfectly just in case anything. But I just wanted to like have some of them. So I don't have all of them, but I have a kind of quite a few of them, and that felt sufficient. I was like, I'm going to leave the house the way it is. <laughs> her dreams. <laughs> Any of the glasses she chose to wear, no fence loose. But um, yeah, the lighter felt right. Okay. Yeah, I, Joseph gave me two boxes, well, and yeah. Um, yeah, you have the best vintage clothing ever. I know my whole wardrobe changed <laughs> overnight. Um, but I, yeah, I because I we we it was funny because we left. I left ten days before we finished it, and I literally went straight in the airport. So I sort of have these two boxes, and I haven't actually opened them because it's it's quite a hard thing to read. But the most amazing gift I got well was from Brighton, who was helping me on set and. She got, uh, I've got three of Tim's glasses mm. over decades framed. So that's how I feel with one of Jenny and his. Oh, that. I kept the cufflinks that I give to Skippy. Oh. And uh, you gave me another pair of cufflinks yeah. that I have. And I also, um, I really liked the, the underwear that Joseph made for me in the <laughs> 70s from the episode he just watched. He personally handed me the underwear and then dyed them in these like almost like underoos colors. <laughs> if you know, you know. And um, so I kept those, and, and I think I kept one of my swimsuits from the seventies as well, yeah. Yeah. and that green jacket from the first oh episode. Oh my god, that green jacket! Oh my god, that jacket! I also just realized right now I'm wearing the ring that um, Marcus and Frankie made promise rings, oh. wore promise rings, and I actually wear it often now. You do? Um, <laughs> you wouldn't marry me? I would, but I don't have that ring. Honey. <laughs> <laughs> well, I want to thank the cast for joining us and thank you for being here.